Number 5. Angela Hammond On the night of April 4th, 1991, 20-year-old Angela Hammond stopped at a grocery store in Clinton, Missouri at about 11.45 p.m. The store was closed, but Angela pulled into the parking lot to use a payphone to call her boyfriend, Rob Schaefer, to tell him that she wasn't coming over as planned. As she talked to her boyfriend, a man in a green Ford F1 pickup truck pulled up beside the phone booth. A filthy bearded man got out of the truck and pretended to look for something. Suddenly, Schaefer heard Hammond scream and then the line went dead. Schaefer got into his car and drove to the grocery store, but on the way he passed a green pickup truck. As he passed, he heard someone scream his name, so he turned his car around and chased the truck for about a mile before his transmission died. The truck drove off into the night, and Angela Hammond hasn't been seen since. Rob Schaefer was investigated and ultimately cleared as a suspect. He says that the man who kidnapped Hammond was wearing glasses, coveralls, and a baseball hat. His truck was from the 1960s or the 1970s, and there was a decal on the back window of a fish jumping out of water. Unfortunately, the man in the truck has never been identified, and the case is currently cold. Number 4. Danny Goldman March 28, 1966, a stocky man with graying hair and armed with a gun broke into the Goldman house in Surfside, Florida. The man, who was in his 50s, gathered up the Goldmans, tied them up, and covered their mouths with tape. He seemed to know the Goldmans and referred to them by their first names. The mysterious man demanded $10,000, but Aaron Goldman said that there was no money in the house. The man then told Aaron to get $25,000 by that night, and as collateral, he would take his son Danny, who was set to turn 18 the next day. The intruder said that he would call the Goldmans later to set up the exchange, and then he and Danny drove off in Danny's car, which was found a few blocks away just hours later. However, no call ever came, and Danny has never been found. There are several theories as to why Danny was kidnapped. At first, the police thought that the home invasion was a setup and Danny actually ran away. The FBI, on the other hand, considered it a kidnapping right away. One possible motive stems from the fact that Aaron Goldman was a board member on a bank that was being investigated by the FBI and Aaron was cooperating with them, which means that the kidnapping could have been retaliation or as a way to intimidate Aaron Goldman. A third theory is that the Goldmans were mistakenly targeted. That is because the kidnapper believed that there was $10,000 in the house, but the Goldmans did not have a reason to keep that much money in their home. A final theory is that Danny's girlfriend at the time set him up. She thought that the Goldmans would have $10,000 in the house to help Danny escape the draft when he turned 18. She had a criminal record, her father was a known criminal, and she had associations with criminals. Two of those associates heard that Danny was killed and then dumped in the Gulf Stream. However, there is no evidence to confirm that theory and Danny Goldman's kidnapping is the oldest cold case in Miami-Dade. Number 3. Antoinette K. Odito At about 3 a.m. on April 6, 1986, a man knocked on the door of the K. Odito family who lived in Gallup, New Mexico. Nine-year-old Antoinette and her sister went to the door, and the person at the door said that he was the girl's Uncle Joe. So Antoinette opened the door, and when she did, the man grabbed her, took her to his vehicle, and drove off. The next morning at 7 a.m., Antoinette's mother went to get the girls up for Bible studies. She was horrified to find that Antoinette was not in the house. The first person she checked with was Antoinette's Uncle Joe, but he didn't come to their house, and he didn't know where Antoinette was. Had this been the only part of the kidnapping, it would have been creepy enough. However, the case has two odd twists. The first one happened about a year after Antoinette went missing. The Gallup Police Department got a call from what sounded like a young girl and she said that she was Antoinette and that she was in Albuquerque. Then the police heard a man say in an angry voice, who said you could use the phone? This was followed by a scuffle, then a scream before the call went dead. Unfortunately, the police were unable to trace the call in time. The second oddity happened four years later. In Carson City, Nevada, a waitress at a restaurant was serving a couple that looked unkempt and a young teenage girl who looked like Antoinette was with them. The girl kept dropping her fork and when the waitress would pick it up and hand it back to her, the girl would squeeze the waitress's hand. After they left, under the girl's plate, there was a note that said, help me, call the police. The police were alerted, but they have not confirmed or denied if the girl in the restaurant was Antoinette. Antoinette's family still holds at hope that after three decades, that she is still alive. Number 2. Asia Degree At 2.30 in the morning on Valentine's Day in the year 2000, nine-year-old Aisha Degree's father checked in on her and saw that she was asleep in her bedroom that she shared with her brother in their Shelby, North Carolina apartment. At 6.30 a.m., when her mother went to wake her for school, she found Aisha's bed empty. Her family and neighbors searched the area, but she couldn't be found, so the police were called. The disappearance corresponded with calls that they had gone earlier in the morning at about 4 a.m. It was storming and two truck drivers reported seeing a little girl walking south on Highway 18, about a mile from Asia's home. 
One driver circled the area three times looking for the girl, only to see her walk into some woods, and she was never seen again. Police believe that Aisha was a victim of foul play, but she probably left the apartment of her own free will. Her parents think that she packed a school bag with some clothes and some candy and left the apartment by herself, locking the door behind her. In the days that followed, several items of Aisha's were found along the highway where she went missing, and some were found in front of a tool shed of an upholstery store. Then 18 months after the disappearance, a contractor found Aisha's backpack buried beside Highway 18, about 26 miles away from Aisha's home, and in the opposite direction of where Aisha was walking on the night that she disappeared. The backpack was double wrapped in a garbage bag, and it was definitely Aisha's because inside the bag was her name and her phone number. In 2016, the police announced that a witness came forward saying that Aisha may have been picked up by someone driving a dark green 1970s either Lincoln Mark IV or Ford Thunderbird with rust around the wheel well. Police are hoping that somebody with information about the case will come forward or the case may remain cold. Number 1. Johnny Gosh On the morning of September 5, 1982, 12-year-old Johnny Gosh got up early to deliver newspapers. He was supposed to deliver the papers with his father, but apparently Johnny got up before his dad and didn't wake him. Johnny and his dog met up with the other paper boys to assemble the newspapers on a street in an affluent neighborhood in West Des Moines, Iowa. A man with dark hair and a mustache driving a two-tone blue Ford Fairmont stopped and talked to the boys and asked for directions. When Johnny left the group of boys, the man started his car and flicked his interior light on and off three times before following Johnny. A man who lived in the neighborhood also saw the mysterious man. He stopped and asked for directions to 86th Street. At about 7.30 a.m., Johnny's parents, Norena and John, got a phone call from somebody on his route and they said that their newspaper hadn't been delivered yet. A short time later, the family dog returned home without Johnny. His parents searched the neighborhood and found his wagon full of newspapers, but Johnny was nowhere to be found. The police were called and they came 45 minutes later. However, they didn't take Johnny's disappearance seriously and they thought he ran away. Two long years went by and the Goshes still had no idea what happened to their son. After his kidnapping, Noreen Gosh worked to change the law surrounding missing children and this brought a lot of attention to his case. In 1984, Johnny became one of the first missing kids to be featured on a milk carton. Also in 1984, another boy disappeared under very similar circumstances. Around 5 a.m. on August 12, 1984, 13-year-old Eugene Martin left his home alone to deliver newspapers in Des Moines. Normally he delivered the papers with his older stepbrother, but that morning he didn't. Witnesses saw Eugene talking to a clean-cut man in his 30s between 5 o'clock and 5.45. They were apparently having a friendly conversation. Another witness saw the man talking to Eugene sometime between 5.45 and 6.05 while Eugene folded his newspapers. 10 to 15 minutes later, Eugene's bag was found with newspapers in it on the sidewalk, but there was no sign of the 13-year-old. The police are unsure if the two disappearances are connected, but they admit that there are a lot of similarities. Creepily enough, this wasn't the end of the case. Noreen Gosh says that she was visited by her son at 2.30 a.m. in March 1997. Johnny would have been 27 at the time, and Noreen said that he had long hair, but showed her a birthmark on his chest to prove that it was him. He told Noreen that he was kidnapped by a national pedophile sex ring, and he was cast out when he got too old. Noreen said that he didn't stay long, and he is currently in hiding because he is too afraid to return home. Then in 2006, an unmarked envelope was left on Noreen Gosh's doorstep on her birthday. Inside, there were two pictures. One of those pictures is on the screen now, and Noreen believes that this is her son Johnny. She says that he is wearing the same pants that he went missing in. Also, she says that she recognizes a birthmark on his chest. The second picture was of three boys who were tied up. They are supposedly two other boys who were kidnapped in Washington State. After getting the pictures, Noreen was sent a few more, and several other people involved with the case were either mailed pictures or sent pictures over the internet of boys who looked like Johnny, and all of them were bound. A police officer in Florida said that he looked into the pictures in the 1970s and said that the boy in the picture wasn't Johnny. However, his claims have never been confirmed and the police in Iowa believe that the pictures are probably just a prank. Noreen, on the other hand, knows that the boy in the picture is her son. Today, the police have no idea who took Johnny Gosh and they do not know if he is dead or alive. Thanks for watching this week's video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We post a new video every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Of course, if you want to check out some other creepy mysteries, please click on one of the videos that we have on the screen now. And thanks again for watching.